Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Leo Lapworth and today I'd like to talk to you about plaque and some of the basics around it. So to start with, well, what is plaque? The framework, the, the way it's described often is that it's super glue for Perl 5 web frameworks and web servers. Now you might ask, how's that actually help you? Well, it's very flexible. There's a whole load of middleware and plugins. There's all sorts of apps. It makes development easier. It makes your testing easier. And also, it helps you with your deployment. And then, OK, well, no, it doesn't really solve world peace, so we'll cross that one off. But before I get into it, let me give you some of the history. So back in the bad old days, we, all, we obviously have to write our Hello World scripts. And we, you might recognize this. This was how you did your own Hello World web script. You're going to print out your content type. So here, text plane, your carriage returns, and then you're going to print Hello World. Well, that's fine. It's a very basic CGI script. But when you wanted to start writing that for Apache, you had to write it like this. So all this extra rubbish at the top, and then you had to create a handler and specify again your content type and you print out your hello world and you return the status. Then, well, what happens if you want this to run under fast CGI? Well, you had to write it like this. Or what happens if you want to run it under something like HTTP server simple? You had to write it like this. So this meant writing portable code was a real pain. All of those were similar, but just different enough to be annoying. And it was painful to support all of these. Now, there was one common way of doing this, and that was CGI PM. So what you used to do, and yeah, I'll come back into that in a moment, uh, but the, what you used to have to do was use CGI, print your header, print hello world, and suddenly everything did just work. It worked under CGI, fast CGI, mod Perl, and a lot of the other web servers. So how'd that look? Well, we had CGI PM that could then talk to Mod Perl. Uh, it could run a CGI under IIS, or it could uh, run on fast CGI for something like, like HTTPD. CGI PM. Well, I think you'll have probably got it from the lightning talk the other day. Meh. It, it, you know, it was all right. It did its job at the time. Um, I don't need to go into all the extra overhead and all those other things. The reason's not to use it. But then we had frameworks. Frameworks came in to help us creating websites, so we didn't have to keep reinventing the wheel. And Perl has quite a few frameworks. <laughs> so how did they actually work when they wanted to handle talking to all of these different web servers? Well, we had CGI PM, so you then had something like CGI application. How's that going to talk to all these web, uh, web servers? Uh, oh, it uses CGI PM. Um, Jifty, ah, that uses CGI PM. Catalyst, well, these guys realized CGI PM wasn't really the way forward, so they wrote their own. They wrote Catalyst Engine, and then for each of the web servers, they had a plugin module that would allow it to run under that. And then when a new server got added, so Nginx comes along, then suddenly CGI PM has to handle that, Catalyst Engine has to handle that. Uh, if you have HTTP server simple, CGI APM supported it. Uh, and then you had the other frameworks coming along like Mason, and Mason only used to run under Mod Perl, uh, except for someone then wrote a compatibility layer to run it under CGI PM, which meant you could run it under all these other things. It's a gross mess. We had all these different frameworks running in different ways. So it meant any time someone wrote a new web server, we had to go and create plugins for all these different mechanisms so that we could run Perl code on these different web servers. Now, all of that was back in 2008. This guy, Mia Gower, came along and said, this isn't the way to be doing this. And I like to think of Mia Gower as a bit of a, a gentleman thief, something of a double agent. He's really interested not just in Perl, but in many languages. So he went off and he acquired some great ideas from the Python and Ruby guys. So from Python, he looked at WSGI. And from Ruby, he looked at Rack. So WSGI is their way of talking to all these different web servers. 
So when you look at the uh, Python frameworks, all of these ones are using WSGI. So how's that look? Well, it looks something like this. You've got WSGI, your application, right at that middle layer in the yellow. Around that, you have some middleware layers. And then at the top, you've got your different types of frameworks. And WSGI is actually using the WSGI handlers to talk to all the different web servers down the bottom. The Rack Ruby guys, again, they've got a lot of different frameworks. And a very similar model. You've got Rack right in the middle, middleware around that. Their frameworks at the top. And again, one set of handlers for dealing with these different web servers. So he said, well, Perl, what have we got? We haven't got anything. So he created PSGI. And that's the Perl Web Server Gateway Interface. Now, this is one thing I must stress. It's the interface. The interface means it is the specification for how things talk between each other. Most of the time, as a normal developer, you don't care about this unless you're writing a framework yourself or possibly a bit of the middleware stuff. PSGI is not PLAC. It's the implementation that PLAC then uses. So the only bit you probably do care about is, well, what is a PSGI application? What does it have to conform to? And ultimately, it's a code reference. And it's that simple. What has to happen is that, um, in this instance, our code reference, we get our environment in. So that's all our, the HTTP request headers and all the other request information. And we then return something out. So let me walk you through that. As I said, the env comes in, and that's your CGI-like environment variables. It's your inputs, it's your form data, it's whatever else is uh, URL parameters, all those sorts of things come in in the env. Then what you have to do is return an array reference with three elements. The first of which is the status code, so 200 success, 302 redirect, 404 not found, whatever it might be. Then you pass in array reference of the headers that you want to return. So here we've got our content type text HTML. And finally, you supply the body. Now the body can either be a string, a file handle, basically anything that conforms to IO handle. And ultimately, that's it. You know, there is callback stuff for if you're doing streaming. But ultimately, that's what you really care about in terms of how a PSGI application works. So we've got our entire PSGI application. So instead of this mess, what we can do is use it in a very similar way to the Ruby and Python guys. So we've got our PSGI compatible app in the middle, our middleware um, around that, and our different frameworks at the top. And the beauty is that we can then just add more compatibility layers down the bottom there for working with different types of web servers. So you might say, well, what web servers? Plaque handle, Handler, which connects applications to different types of web servers, has handlers for fast CGI, for Apache 1 and 2, for Starman, which is a pre-forking HTTP server, which is very fast, uh, HTTP server simple PSGI, which has very few external dependencies, which is really useful if you're trying to deploy something quickly just to a, an unknown environment. Then there's Twiggy for non-blocking, Starlet. Uh, there's plugins for Perlbal, for Nginx, for Mod PSGI, for Corona, for Fearsome, for all these different framework, sorry, different web servers. So now, as long as you're talking PSGI, you can interact with all these different web servers. So if you want to test how good is your code running under a different environment, it's very easy to port it. So there's over 25 of these. You know, if you really want to go and try every single one, you know, it'll take you a little while. So, well, as I've mentioned, all the old frameworks were using all sorts of different ways. So who has adopted PSGI and PLAC? Well, out of that list that I showed you earlier, all of these ones have already converted over. 
Most of the ones that haven't is just because there's not much development happening on them. So our list of Perl frameworks that work with PSGI now looks something like this. A lot of the applications that people use within Perl, so movable type, web GUI, request tracker, all those sorts of things, have also converted over. So for Perl, our list of what goes at the top, the, the frameworks, is quite substantial. So how does one use this from a framework? If you're using something like Dancer, you just say dance. And what happens is you get a PSGI compatible app returns from that. Or if you're using Mojolicious, you say start. If you're using Jifty, you say you want your Jifty app and you want the PSGI. Uh, Web Server Simple as PSGI. Catalyst, in fact, if you're using an old Catalyst before 5.9, you just call setup engine and pass it PSGI. But if you're using anything after 5.9, it is the default. All Catalyst apps return you a PSGI application. So what's PLAC? Well, PSGI is the implementation, the specification. PLAC is actually using it. It's the toolkit that goes around that specification. So what do we get in this toolkit? Well, I've already mentioned all the handlers for talking to the web servers. We get PLAC up, which is a command line launcher, very useful for when debugging and testing. Uh, PLAC loader, which um, will load up the different types of servers. And it also allows you to monitor your lib directory. So for, if you make a code change, it can restart that server for you just whilst you're developing, so you don't have to keep stopping and starting. There's a whole load of middleware. And the beauty of the middleware is that once someone writes that middleware, it's available to any PSGI-compatible application. So that middleware can now be used across multiple frameworks rather than having to write it bespoke each time for each different framework. There's Plaque Builder, which is an object-orientated, domain-specific language that allows you to plug in all that middleware together. Then various apps for doing things. I'll show you those in a few minutes. And then also Plaque Test, which allows you to test all of this. So Plaque Up allows you to, from the command line, launch your Plaque App. And all you have to do is type Plaque Up, plaque up and app.psgi. And app.psgi is, is your configuration for all of this, where you join all your middleware together, and then you put in your application. Now, in fact, if you've actually called the file app.psgi, you don't even need to specify it here, because that's the file it will look for by default. So if we run plaque up, we get this message. HTTP server, PSGI accepting connections on my local host port 5000. It uses HTTP server PSGI by default, um, because that follows the specification, and it's a single process HTTP server, which is very useful just for developing and testing. So we want to add middleware. What, what can middleware do for us? Well, we've got debugging, we've got session management, logging, static content serving, reverse proxying, error document handling, throttling. Um, actually, there's quite a list of things. Um, I couldn't actually fit them all on the slide, so we'll move that up a bit and add some more. Um, there's just a huge amount of these things out there that are already ready for you to use across any of the frameworks. So how does the middleware fit together? Middleware is for pre-processing of the request and post-processing of the response. So as a request comes in, it goes through these layers, you have your application in the middle, and then you get the response out. So your outer layer, you probably want to do things like logging, uh, maybe just do a quick redirect, or handle some errors, or cache some content, uh, maybe do some session management, maybe redirect so you can have multiple apps running on different URLs. And then in the middle, you have your actual application. So let me take you through that in a bit more detail. It looks like this. So as the request comes in, it first hits our outer layer. From that, it can then go on to the next layer, and eventually it hits your application. And then on the way back out, once your application has sent a response, each layer gets a chance to do something with that response. 
and send it back out to the user. Now, it may be that a layer decides, hang on, actually, I've done everything that needs to happen, and it can shortcut it. So in this instance, we might do a redirect, or we might serve some static content. And that means that you can make your applications a lot simpler by having middleware handle the regular things, the logging, the serving static content, all of those sorts of things you don't have to deal with in your own application. So you, how do we actually turn these things on? Well, let's say um, we're going to do it like this. So we've got our application that conforms to our standards. We use Plaque Builder. And then you return a builder enabling these layers of middleware. Now, in fact, if your middleware is in the Plaque Middleware namespace, you don't need to write that out in full. Um, but in this, so for example, A here is Plaque Middleware A, but you can, of course, specify your own if you want to build custom middleware. And the order of these things matters because of the onion, the way that things are wrapping around each other. And then finally, at the bottom, you have your app. So one of the middlewares is static. And this enables you to serve static content, your images, CSS files, whatever it might be. So what we're going to do is we're going to enable the static middleware. We're going to tell it where our document root is. And then we're going to pass a path here, a regular expression. So anything that matches slash static will be served by this middleware directly. After that, we're actually going to enable the plaque middleware deflator, which does gzip compression. Now, of course, I want that after the static content, because I don't want, you know, I can't, compressing my JPEG is not going to give me any advantage. So what will happen is the static layer, the static layer will get a request and send that straight out to the user. Then the next layer gets a chance to do something, in this instance, a, a compression. So, well, we're not going to compress on the way in, so it's going to do nothing and pass that straight onto my application. I can generate my response, and my response then goes through the middleware deflate, which does the compression based on whether the browser accepts it or not. Of course, static's already done its job. It's going to ignore the response, and then that information goes back out. You can actually enable middleware on the command line when you're running plaque up, which is useful for turning on debugging layers. So middleware allows us as a community to write all of these wonderful extensions once and apply it to every framework. So let me show you a few demos of how this all kind of fits together. So we're going to assume we've got a plaque builder. We've got some HTML that's going to be returned. So here's our little application that's going to return 200. It's a success, the content type, and my body. One of the middlewares we have is the debugger. So we can say we're going to enable debug on our application. So to launch that, I open my terminal. I do plaque up debug demo. And I've got confirmation that that's now running on my local host on port 5000. So if I point my browser at that, you see, way I've got hello world, it worked. But I've also got this whole panel on the right-hand side, which gives me lots of interesting information. I can click on environment, and I can see all of the request information that has come in without having to do a lot of print dumper statements on the environment. So I get a pretty way of looking at that very quickly. I can actually look at the response. What header information did I actually send back out to the user? So I can do this in my browser rather than having to enable Firebug on Firefox and, or all the different types of ways of doing that. I can also see how long the request took and, indeed, how much memory that request took. There's also other things like there's the interactive debugger. So again, exactly the same thing. The only thing is we're intentionally we're going to die here. So something throws a, an error. When I enable my de interactive debugger, I launch my script, uh, my application, and when I now go to that, what I see is a very pretty stack trace of exactly what has gone on line by line. And I can actually put my mouse over an individual row. I can click on the uh, console there, and it drops me into a console so I can actually interrogate my code at this point. So if I print data dumper dump of foo, 
Uh, indeed, I then get told that the variable was bar, and thankfully that's why we died. So you can see how it's very useful for when you're actually developing your websites. You can do all sorts of other things. So there's the MYT prof profiler. Now, hopefully, everyone knows the first rule of programming optimization. Anyone? Don't do it. Thank you very much. And the second rule for the experts? Indeed, don't do it yet. Once you have really, really, really decided that you need to look at optimization, the debugger has panels. So you can add extra layers of information um, into your debugger, or indeed write your own custom ones. So here I'm going to start my profile, um, MIT Prof app. When I go to that, I get to see my page, and I also get this MIT Prof link in my debug panel. If I click on that, that puts us directly into looking at the NYT profiler for this code. I can see how long each line of code's taken, what calls what, uh, where the loops are, how many modules get called. I can look at pretty maps of where in my code most of the time was spent, all sorts of things. For those people who are coming from an Apache background, where you want to look at server status information, uh, there's a plugin for that, so you can look at server status light here. We're going to say, well, what URL is this information going to sit on? Who are we going to allow access to? So only from local host. And a scoreboard where we need to save that information. Now, if I was running that just with this built-in web server, it wouldn't really work because you only get one request at a time. So in this instance, I'm going to use minus s, which says which server and I'm going to use the Starman web server. So when I start that up, I then get this other information telling me all about the ports and the bindings, the fact I'm running this under Starman. So I can now go to my website and go to slash server hyphen status, and I get told what requests were happening, um, how many workers I have, whether they're idle or not. So it's a pretty good replacement when, if, you, if you were using the Apache server status. There's also a similar one for size limit. So I know no one ever writes code that leaks memories, but just in case, you can have this which will say, look, once this process has hit a size limit, we want to reap that process and spawn a new one, that worker. So, and how many times, you, how often you want that to be checked. We also have a lot of stuff in the plaque app namespace. And these are ready to use little applications. Again, they do all sorts of different things. Um, let me show you a, a couple of those. Plaque App CGI bin will mount a CGI directory as if it was PSGI applications. So if you want to start using a lot of these goodies, these middlewares, on your existing CGI applications, you can do so. There's also CGI PSGI which allows you to migrate your existing CGI PM applications over to Plaque and PSGI without having to do a huge amount of extra work. There's other things like Plaque App Directory. Um, I saw on IRC the other day someone uh, was saying, oh, can I access your mirror of CPAN on your local machine? And they were, oh, how do, how do I do this? Well, if you literally just use Plaque App Directory, point it at directory and suddenly that whole directory and subdirectories are available for someone to browse off the, your own machine. There's Plaque App Proxy, which is a proxy server and does reverse proxying as well. There's all sorts of things. There's Plaque App JSP. You know, everyone obviously wants to write JavaScript uh, and have that running under your PSG environment. I'm not saying this is a good thing. And I suppose that actually a useful one is the URL map. So what this allows you to do here, for example, we have a, a Catalyst application, C1, and a CGI application, C2. And what you can see is that C1 there, I'm going to mount it on slash cat. And C2, which I'm going to have custom middleware added to, so I'm going to use the builder there, I'm going to mount it onto CGI app. So you can have multiple applications mounted on different URLs on your domain. So some more demos. 
There's all sorts of things. I, I often find people ask me, normally parents and relatives, can you build me a website? And well, I like using Template Toolkit, um, but all these sites are pretty much static. Now, Template Toolkit comes with a very useful utility called Tree Tree. So you can say, look, here's my directory, parse that and stick it out over there. But even that, I'm just too lazy. So what I want to do is I want to have every page on my site automatically processed with Template Toolkit. So here, I'm going to say where my document root is. I'm going to pass that into Plaque Middleware Template Toolkit. This module will work as middleware or as an app, hence the two apps, so we get an application back. Then within my builder, I don't want my Template Toolkit to handle serving my static content. And you'll see here, I'm now not supplying a, a path, but a regular expression of just the file extensions that I want to be served by static. And then I pass my application at the bottom. So if I then use that, point it to any directory, all the files will be parsed as if they were template toolkit. You can also start plugging all this stuff together in very interesting ways. So caching proxy. At work, we were talking to this government website, and it was really slow. So as we were developing the code, we kept making requests, making requests, making requests. And it ultimately was just painful. Because we, as we were developing, we kept having to request the same information. So you thought, well, how can we stick a proxy in the middle there? So our proxy can fetch the content once from there, but allow us to keep developing against that cache version. So what we did was we created a plaque app proxy. I'm going to uh, demo this against the London PM site, which isn't slow, but just for the case of uh, showing it to you. We then create a builder, and we use the caching middleware. So we're going to say cache anything, hence the slash star, and here's the directory you can cache to. So I launch that, and then when I go to my local host, what I'm seeing is the London PM website. So it's pretty cool. And as I refresh that, I can pull the network cable out, and it's still working because all that information is cached. So I can run my tests against that using LWP Simple, getting the local host. I actually posted a blog about this. And someone came back and said, well, that's very cute. But you know, I, I don't like to have my tests point to local host, because anything could be run, running on that. What I want to do is I, I want it to be readable. So someone said, you can hijack domains. Said, OK, so instead of having to write this, what we could do is write that. So I said, well, OK, how does that work? So our code we had before looked like this. The difference we're going to do is instead of returning the app, we're going to set the new value of app to be what's come back, because we want to do something further with it. Builder just returns that application. So you can call it multiple times and, and deal with it. It's only at the very end that you need to return your final app that's got all its middleware and its other things. So now we've got that app. As I said, we want this code. We use LWP protocol PSGI, and you register the application for that. And what that does is that hijacks LWP, and it says, look, any request you get, send it through me. So that then means as we pass the application in, I can then print a little, yay, it worked at the bottom. Does this content have London Pearl Muggers on it? I run my script, and yay, I get my little happy man. So it's really interesting all the things you can do with plugging this stuff together. We also have plaque test. So here, what I can do is I can use plaque test at the top. I can say, test the PSGI. So I then pass in my application to that. And then the client, which is going to pretend to be your web browser, you pass in a subroutine. And the first thing it gets is a callback. So you use that callback. We're going to prepare our request, so it's going to be a simple get, because I'm using HTTP request common at the top there. We pass that into our callback, and we get the response from that. And our response is our three uh, elements of an array reference. So of course, the first element is going to be the status code. And I can confirm that that worked. Now, it may be that you're already using test mechanize. 
If you are, it's a very simple thing to then upgrade it to use PSGI, use test up, 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 mechanized PSGI. And so here what we do is we just pass in the app to that. One of the really interesting things for me as we migrated over to this was the fact that previously we'd had an awful lot of the config in our Apache startup, conf uh, in our Apache configuration, serving static head headers, setting um, timeouts and expire headers and all sorts of other things. But with this, because all of that lives in your app.psgi, you're actually testing your full configuration, not just your application code, but actually what your configuration for deployment is. A, a little tip when you're setting up networks um, is to look at using a reverse proxy. So a reverse proxy sits in front of your web servers, not your clients, so hence reverse. It makes your servers more efficient. It means adding things like HTTPS is a lot easier, makes scaling a lot easier. So yeah, our standard environment is we've got our internet users talking directly to our web server, and our web server responds back to our users. Well, that's fine as long as your users are all on fast local connections. The moment you have an international user on a mobile phone, your web server is going to be sitting there for ages trying to get that content back to them. So for that reason, we want to put in a reverse proxy in the middle. So there's lots of different ones, Nginx, Perlbao, Pound, loads of others. Um, so what they do is when the response comes in, they get the response, sorry, the request. They pass it on to the web server, your application. That goes back to the proxy. Your application is now finished it can get on with the next request coming in. And the reverse proxy is the bit that then sits there and serves the content back to the user. One of the other interesting bits with this is, so if we look at just this layer here, if we want to make our system, our site scalable um, and a bit more resilient, we can add a second server. So the front end doesn't need to know, the user doesn't need to know anything about this. And indeed, we can go and add a third server to that. What's really cool, though, is in a catastrophe, your user never knows that you've just lost a server because everything's just load balanced across the other two machines, which also makes maintenance easy. If you're doing an upgrade, you can do it machine at a time without having to have any downtime. So the reason I mention all of this is if you are using a reverse proxy, you need to look at using plaque middleware reverse proxy. What this does is it converts the environment so that your code sees the remote address, i.e. the user's IP address. If you weren't using this, you'd be getting your proxy layer's IP address. So I started with why use Plaque. Hopefully, you'll see that it's flexible. There's a huge amount of middleware. Lots of apps, development and testing and deployment are all made easier. So the flexibility means that you can move between web servers and to just test them out. For our environment at work, we actually um, had a problem when we were upgrading to ModPerl 2, and we thought, oh, th this is going to be a, a major issue. I wonder if Starman's better. And it was amazing the difference in terms of the loads that was appearing on our machine when we switched over. But it meant we didn't have to go and recode our entire system just to test something out it was a very easy switch over. The middleware means that we can reuse that in any PSGI app, so even internally if you're writing something you can use it across your applications very easy because it's been separated out. There's lots of tools around that just making your life easier. There's well over 200 of those on CPAN. The app side of things lets us do URL mapping, routing, serving static content, proxying content, all that sort of thing. And for development, we've got PlackUp, we've got Restarter, which is the bit I was mentioning. It monitors your code directory, so as you're developing, you just save your file and it'll restart your web server. ACP Server PSGI for doing simple website testing, debugging middleware, the profiler, the testing, testing your full configuration and interoperable with dub 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 mechanize. So it means when you're deploying, you don't have to have lots of separate configuration files. 
and it's easy to switch between those web servers. There's lots of companies starting, so DocCloud and various other ones, that allow you with one command to deploy your PSGI compatible application onto their web servers. Thanks. Almost there. So in summary, PSGI is the interface, PLAC is the code and the toolkit. There's lots of fast PSGI uh, web servers. There's uh, adapters and tools for most of the major Perl frameworks. In fact, I'm unsure of any that don't use it these days. And there's an amazing amount of middleware. And all of this is being used in a lot of production servers um, within the Perl community. So I suppose, really, I'd just say use PLAC. Thank you. Are there any questions? If you have to use a patchy, how stable is mod PSGI? I don't know. I've not used it myself. Um, but from what I hear, it works. Um, but if you join the hash plaque IRC channel, uh, they should be able to answer that there. Any others? Uh, the question is, how much of the middleware is used by most of the frameworks? Um, they all use different amounts of it. I think most of them, um, have, they now conform to PSGI, but they aren't using the middleware directly in them yet. Um, but I know that is in the pipeline for a couple of them to actually rely on the middleware rather than um, to have their own stuff. So the main thing they've done is switched over to using this so it's easy for you to wrap middleware. Um, but which bits they've implemented internally um, does change from framework to framework. Um, I think Catalyst um, has a default set. So when you're just doing a Catalyst app, you will automatically be using a certain set of middleware. Um, and then you have to override that if you want to use your own instead. Uh, can you mix, match, plaque, wrap, and WSGI? Um, I don't know is the answer. I assume, well, I guess so. If you're running Apache, uh, for example, you'd just be launching it on um, different URLs, or do you mean com communicating? Ah, uh, that's way beyond me. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'd imagine not, but I don't know. Any more? Thank you very much. <laughs>